Hi, I'm Kathy Sacco, VP of International Children's Policy at First Focus on Children. On October 6, 2021, the World Health Organization recommended the first malaria vaccine for children. Dr. Pedro Alonso, director of the WHO's Global Malaria Program, called the endorsement of the vaccine a historic event. Today, we are honored to be able to speak with malaria and global child health expert, Dr. Miriam K. Lawfer, about the importance of this vaccine for children around the world. Dr. Miriam Lawfer is Professor of Pediatrics, Medicine, Epidemiology, and Public Health and faculty of the graduate program in microbiology and, immuno and immunology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Dr. Lawfer is a pediatric infectious disease specialist with a primary interest in malaria and global child health. She has conducted research, clinical care, and professional education in resource-limited countries in Africa and Asia, and has dedicated nearly two decades to working in Malawi. She and her research team use clinical and laboratory research to develop and evaluate interventions to decrease the burden of malaria in Sub-Saharan Africa. She currently serves as principal investigator for clinical trials, epidemiological studies, and a Fogarty training grant that support her collaboration with colleagues throughout the US, Europe, and Africa. Her current research focuses on the impact of infections, including malaria and HIV, during pregnancy on infant immunity and early childhood development, the interaction between HIV and malaria, and identifying re reservoirs of malaria transmission. So welcome, Dr. Lawfer, and thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Thanks. So to begin, I know malaria is rare in the United States. So can you tell us more about malaria and how and where does it affect children? Sure. So malaria is caused by a parasitic infection that's transmitted by the bite of infected mosquitoes. It uh, primarily affects children because children have no immunity to the infection. In high transmission settings, children get infected multiple times. And those first few times they get infected, they can get quite sick. Then with further infection and exposure, and as they get older, they get, they're less likely to get sick when they get infected. The mosquitoes that transmit malaria are actually everywhere in the world. In the 1800s, there was malaria here in the US. But right now where we see the highest burden is by far in children in Sub-Saharan Africa. So among the 400,000 or so children who die of malaria every year, about 95% of those are children in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the disease is also present in South America, the South Pacific, as well as the Southeast Asia. So can you tell me why is the announcement of this vaccine for children a big deal? So this is the first vaccine against malaria that's ever been approved. It's actually the first vaccine against any human parasite that's ever been approved. And uh, malaria has been around since really the beginning of humans. And we have been struggling since we understood how it was transmitted about 100 years ago to try to figure out how to prevent infection. Malaria is a very complicated parasite. It's been very hard to develop a vaccine. And even though this vaccine isn't perfect, uh, it's amazing that the community has come together to agree that with, a, with an infection that causes so much disease and death, even a 30% effective vaccine like the RTSS vaccine is something that needs to be implemented in order, in order to save lives. Great, thank you. And and I guess you, um, I just wanted to go back to, you said about 30% effectiveness. Um, and then just comparing that to like, what is the effectiveness, uh, for instance, of bed nets in preventing malaria? So it's a good question. Um, and, it's a little bit hard to compare those two to each other because they're measured so differently. Um, probably uh, the use of bed nets compared to having no bed nets at all is more than 30% effective in preventing severe disease. But most countries that have a high burden of malaria and then are considering using this new malaria vaccine, 
do already have bed net programs in place. What has been seen is that not only does, does RTSS protect children further against malaria, even if they are using bed nets, but there's a fair number of children out there who don't have access to bed nets for one reason or another. And by providing the vaccine, you actually increase equity, you actually increase the number of children who are protected by at least one anti-malaria intervention. And actually, that's a great segue because I was going to ask, how does this vaccine reduce inequities in malaria prevention? So access to vaccination programs is really has really been um, perfected in low resource settings. You know, there's vaccines offered at health centers. There's mobile clinics that go out to hard to reach areas. There are vaccine campaigns. And so access access to vaccines and the addition of malaria to the vaccine um, regimen really does provide access pretty broadly to young children, even in resource limited settings. And when they did surveys looking at children's access to various anti-malarial interventions, the addition of RTSS vaccine does increase the proportion of children who have some protection against malaria. Great. Now you mentioned you said the vaccine is for young children. So what um, what vaccines, if any, are available for older children, like those who are school aged? Yeah, that's a great question. So this this vaccine was designed to protect the very youngest children. So in the they they get their first vaccine at five months of age, and then they get three doses then, and then one more dose about a year or two later. And most malaria control efforts have really focused on children under five because children under, under five are the, are the population most likely to die from malaria. So absolutely appropriate that our number one priority is protecting those very vulnerable children. However, what we're finding as we're looking more carefully is that there's a lot of malaria infection and disease also in slightly older children so that school age population, the over five to under 15 year old group also have an ex a very high burden of malaria infection. They actually have more malaria than children under five. When they're feeling sick, they don't get quite as sick as the younger children, but they don't get taken to healthcare. They're the least likely group to sleep under bed nets and they tend to have infections for a very long time. And there, there are certainly implications for malaria in this population. One, they can be chronically ill and develop you know, anemia over time, which is associated with poor growth and poor development. And uh, our recent reviews have shown that children who have chronic malaria also uh, perform less well in school. So there's really long-term implications for a high burden of malaria, even, be, even when children over five years of age. And this vaccine so far has really not, not uh, addressed that problem. So will the vaccine um, or is there research into um, using this vaccine for the older age population? I think that will be the next step. Um, right now, there's going to be enough of a challenge to vaccinate the children under five um, because the vaccine, is, you know, we'll need to make enough of the vaccine, figure out the, the financing of the vaccine, figure out the administration of the vaccine. And the the uh, needs for school-aged children are pretty broad with respect to vaccination programs. And there's a lot of effort now in expanding vaccination programs in schools to address school the health of school-aged children. That includes HPV vaccine, it includes other boosters, and I hope someday it will also include malaria vaccination. You had mentioned about the, I think, 400,000 children that die from malaria each year. So how many children could this vaccine benefit? That's a question that has really only been addressed through modeling. We don't know yet. Fortunately, most uh, children who get malaria survive. So the case fatality rate is quite low. And even though they've enrolled 400,000 children in the operational pilot studies that um, were reviewed last week at the WHO that led to this recommendation. They did show a benefit in survival, but it was not statistically significant, which means that they just 
you know, fortunately do not have enough fatal cases of malaria to be able to say with confidence exactly how protective it is. We did see 30% protection against severe disease, but only se but 7% protection against deaths. Um, but with, that was sort of too small for us to say with too much certainty. So with the modeling, the expectation is that this vaccine could save about 25,000 lives per year. But I also think uh, one of the major impacts will be on overall child health, you know, decreasing anemia, less missed, uh, less um, visits to the health center, less lost work for parents, and all those benefits of having healthier children. Thank you. Um, so what does the this vaccine mean for other parasitic device or diseases um, that have harmful impacts on children's health? So it certainly does highlight that uh, if you get a good enough vaccine for an important infection, there will be an approval process available. You know, for these mm -hmm. diseases that impact only low resource settings, it, there's not great financial incentive to develop a vaccine. It's very expensive, very laborious process. And there is no you know, rich country market that will allow you to sort of recoup some of your expenses. Uh, the international community has tried to address that through organizations that help with vaccine financing. But I think once you see that GSK that produced this vaccine was able to get the vaccine through the whole regulatory approval process and receive endorsement from the WHO, it really does point to the fact that there's a way forward for these vaccines, even if there's no first world market. That's great news, actually. Um, so one of the questions I have uh, been wondering about that I know in the news, it was saying that it took this malaria vaccine took 100 years to develop. Um, and yet the COVID-19 vaccine we've seen um, took about a year. So can you explain why did it take so long to develop this vaccine, but such a short time to develop the COVID-19 vaccine? So there are a few things. First of all, there's a big difference between viruses and parasites. So a virus is one single strand uh, in the case of COVID of RNA. It has about 20 to 25 proteins that it can express. Um, in contrast, the malaria parasite has 14, its genes are organized into 14 genomes. It has thousands of proteins. So it's a much more complicated organism. And it's not quite accurate to say that the COVID-19 vaccine was developed in a year. There had been several decades of vaccine development and virology in very related uh, viruses, you know, including the SARS virus, the MERS virus, that really put us in a position where we were poised to develop a vaccine very quickly, but we did not develop this vaccine in one year. It was, we were pretty far along because of earlier research. Uh, with malaria, and so the advantage of, um, of the viral vaccine is the protein, you know, the genome is relatively simple. And we knew exactly, or we figured out pretty early exactly what the protein was that was responsible for attaching and invading cells. That's the spike protein. That's, the, that's the, the target of all the vaccines. In contrast with malaria, where we have thousands of proteins, we there are so many of them and they are so different from each other. We don't actually know which protein is responsible for invasion of the parasite into the red blood cell or the survival of the parasite in the liver where it sort of hides out and, and evades the, our human immune response. All of those things we still don't quite know because of the complexity of the life cycle. And that as a result, even if we were, you know, the vaccine, for example, that we made now, uh, the RTSS vaccine, it's chosen one target, but obviously it's not the target that is responsible for all malaria replication because you know, 70% of the time the malaria still survives despite the vaccine. Thank you for that answer because I, I had gotten questions um, from other friends and things of why did it take so long? Um, and in mentioning the COVID-19, uh, what does the COVID-19 pandemic mean for the rollout and distribution of this vaccine for children? <laughs> 
It's interesting you should ask that. I had sort of assumed that it was going to be a disaster. You know, the uh, halfway into the initial piloting study, COVID hit, got there, you know, countries really shut down, healthcare workers weren't able to work because they didn't have adequate um, protective gear. And I had thought that this was going to really delay the availability of results of the pilot study. But it turns out remarkably that the distribution of the vaccine just continued. And that's probably because the um, local immunization programs continued. They're, the dedication of healthcare workers in these settings is really remarkable. And I think people understood the importance of this study of the malaria vaccine. People know every everybody in, in the countries where they were doing the pilot studies knows somebody who lost a child to malaria and they continue to give the vaccine despite all these obstacles. So there was really remarkably good vaccine uptake even despite all of the problems associated with the COVID pandemic. That's actually great news because I know one of the things that we were um, or that I was even looking at was just what happened to the routine vaccination rates you know, during the pandemic and things. So that's great news. You know, um, I'll say that the, the studies were chosen to be in sites where the vaccine program is very strong, so that the strong programs were really able to withstand some of the stresses of the COVID vaccine trial, which is not to say, of the COVID vaccine pandemic, which is not to say that happened everywhere, but it did happen for these particular settings. Great, thanks. So a uh, final question is, um, Obviously, we're seeing the benefits of investments in research and, and programs, and like you talked about, even just immunization distribution programs and things on the ground. So my final question is, how can we make sure children are a priority in the development of such vaccines and other children's global health issues in the federal budget, if you have any thoughts or ideas? It's a very good question. You know, the, the, the challenge of uh, child health in resource limited settings is that, you know, we're looking at investment in the future, which is very hard to, for people to perceive compared to an effect right now. So yes, vaccines will save lives, which is important, but it will keep children healthier, help them to succeed in school and do well later in their lives. This is something that I know that you focus on in your organization. And it becomes a little bit harder to quantify dollar wise uh, for people to in a way that people can understand. The other thing to keep in mind is that this has been a spectacularly collaborative process between the affected countries, international organizations, international donors, um, but the, we're not out of the woods yet. So there still is going to be the need to figure out the financing of this vaccine. It is not cheap. It's not super expensive, but as vaccines go, but it's not cheap either. And so although the WHO has recommended the use of this vaccine in children in, high, in moderate to high bur malaria burden settings, there still needs to be an agreement about how the funding is going to work to make sure we're not taking away from already um, effective interventions, but that we're able to use this, this amazing tool that will save lives even further. So are there things that we as ordinary citizens can advocate for in this funding or um, in these efforts? You know, the organization that will probably debate this and um, make a decision is called Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccine and Immunizations. The United States does contribute to that. So to the extent that you can help to advocate with your government leaders to, uh, to highlight the importance of the malaria vaccine in the, in the vaccine portfolio and in funding priorities, I think it would be helpful. Thanks so much, Dr. Lawfer. Um, this has been such an enlightening conversation and I just wanna thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise and thoughts um, as to why the malaria vaccine is so important and also um, that foreign assistance investments are needed for the health and well-being of children and youth around the globe. 
So, and I wanna just um, also give a huge thank you to all the people who are watching online from home or in their office. And just a final plug to just say, if you visit www.firstfocus.org, you can find resources and information um, about why all issues are kids' issues. So thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Lawfer.